So I title this classroom management and classroom discipline, is there a difference? You know, a lot of times when you talk about classroom management, especially when I'm doing undergrad courses and graduate courses as well, there's several people in grad courses that aren't teaching yet, haven't had their first job, that, you know, classroom management, we all know, is one of those things you just have to get in there, get your hands wet, and, and just do it. You know, you could read textbook after textbook, you could watch video after video, but until you get in there for your internship or you get your first job, I don't want to say nothing makes sense. Of course, it makes sense, but you're not really applying the knowledge. You know, it's the I do, we do, you do mentality, and it's, yeah, I can do it, and we can do it in the classroom, but when it comes to the you do part of it, it's impossible to do because you're in the coursework at your university. All right, so with that being said, we're going to do a little activity, and we're going to meet Mr. Grimes, and I've done this workshop uh, in my in my uh, EDF 6415 class for you UCF students, change it a little bit. I've done this at, at conferences around the country. And I'm going to introduce you to Mr. Grimes. And this is a video that's about almost 60 years old. But, you know, I use it for many different reasons. One is to show you some of the classroom management issues that Mr. Grimes is going to have. But the also side of it is this is a 60-year-old video, and it's black and white I'm about to show you. And a lot of the same things still occur in the classroom. So hopefully our conversation today and our discussion will shed some new light on how we can shape our classroom in a way and how we interact with our students, how we model behaviors will eliminate all of the discipline problems. So what I want you to do is, is very simple. I'm going to put up a little video here for you. I'm going to make it full screen. We're going to watch about four or five minutes of it. And basically, this is an educational video. And in the first part, it shows our teacher, Mr. Grimes, in his classroom. And he demonstrates all of the bad things Mr. Grimes is doing. And then the second half of the video, obviously, is the good things. He changes around, does everything the proper way. But we're not going to watch that part of it. I'm just going to watch it for the first four or five minutes. What I want you to do as you're observing Mr. Grimes, you're going to play, play the role of the administrator right now. And in the text box, just go ahead and, and jot down some of the things that you see that Mr. Grimes is doing that you would think is inappropriate or not good in classroom management or classroom behavior strategies in there. So you know, we don't need complete sentences, just quick thoughts, the first things you see. And just feel free to type as many as you want. So let's go ahead and, and meet Mr. Grimes here. I'm going to make the screen a little smaller here. All right, let's go ahead and meet him. The vast majority of behavior problems in the classroom involve minor breaches of discipline. These incidents frequently originate in the classroom situation itself and are within the control of the teacher. Disciplinary problems in the classroom are symptoms of underlying weaknesses in total learning situations. Mr. Grimes, mathematics teacher, is displeased with the progress of his ninth grade class in mathematics. You see what low grade you, you made on your weekly test. mathematics test? More than half of you, failed. Half of you failed. Most of those who passed, those those who got passed by. just got Nobody by. Had Nobody had 100%. This is the poorest this class, is the poorest I've, class had I've had in a long, long, long time. Most of you have no Most foundation, have no at, foundation all. at all. Now the trouble's with your now attitude. With your attitude. You, don't pay you don't pay enough attention in class. In class. You don't do enough, work, don't do enough work outside of it. You don't know what the word, you don't know what the word means. study it's means. You have the slightest idea. Don't you realize that, mathematics, realize that is mathematics is an subject? important subject? I tell you right I tell now, you right unless now, you get over, your, you over your lazy habit, come up to the standards I set for this class, many of you will many have, you will have the pleasure of repeating this semester. course next semester. Well, what is it? Well, what is it? I have to leave for a few minutes. I have to leave for a few minutes. Now I want you to open, your, want books. You to open your books. And work out correct solutions to the problems you missed. Miss. I can't 
stop it there. It goes on for another couple of minutes. All right, so obviously, you know, that's a drastic exaggeration on things. It's meant to be. It's used for educational purposes, and yes, it's 60 years old, but, you know, if you're in the classroom now, or maybe you observe some teachers, I know I've, I've had the opportunity, I was certified to help administrators when I was teaching middle school to observe teachers, and, uh, you know, you hear and see some of those comments still. Uh, I want you to think back to your uh, experience in high school or middle school. Uh, you know, maybe you had, odds are you had a teacher that maybe didn't act 110% like Mr. Grimes, but some of those things that he was saying or doing uh, might radiate some truth for you and your experience, and, and it's sad. It's definitely a sad situation when we have an educator that, that displays some of those things. So, you know, yes, like I said, drastic examples, and everybody put really great observations about it. He had a lot of low expectations. Um, kids were bored. They were acting out, and he was blaming the students. You know, that's a big thing when, you, when you're an educator. And I remember from my classroom experiences in high school and even knowing some of the teachers I work with, and I've even been guilty of it myself when I first started out teaching uh, years ago that, when a student does bad, it could be on an individual basis or a classroom basis. If a, if a student or students do poorly on a test, um, telling them that they didn't do well because they didn't study hard enough or they didn't study. And, you know, I know myself, I'll admit it, I've said that before in the past, and I remember teaching say, teachers saying that. But there's a big part of that statement that's a problem that, you know, teachers I'm not saying we're not effective teachers, but something that we don't think about is maybe that student tried to study. Maybe they just didn't get the material. Maybe they just don't know how to study, thus doing poor on exams. So there's a lot of variables that come into play when it comes to student performance in the classroom. So I just wanted to add that note in there as we start the discussion. So we met Mr. Grimes, and you guys gave a great observations on what you saw. So let's move on to our discussion that the topic of our conversation is classroom management. And like I mentioned before, feel free to raise your hand with the motion con at any moment if you have any questions or concerns. All right, so classroom management and discipline are not the same. We know this. You know, management obviously is how we set up our class and how we do things as a teacher, how we teach, how we observe. And the management describes how your class is organized and structured to stop potential problems. That's the key. And discipline is something that compromises your instruction. Now, as an effective teacher in the classroom, your number one goal, obviously, is that you want your students to be prepared and have the necessary tools and abilities to move on to other classes, move on outside of their school career, and be successful. So the point is to minimize any discipline problems in the classroom. Is it possible 
of course it's possible. It's all about how you represent yourself as an educator, how you construct your classroom, how you manage your classroom, and your type of body language and enthusiasm and motivation as an instructor for your students. Whether you're elementary, middle, high school, or even at the college level, there are so many different variables that come into play. And we only have an hour together, but we're going to talk about, we're going to separate all of this ideas and construction of classroom management into four easy categories. I'll give you as many examples as I possibly can, and I'd love you to share things as well. So how do we prevent the problems? First, I want you to ask yourself a couple of questions here. OK, let's start off with this first question. Why did you get hired? We have several people in this workshop here that have not been hired yet. Uh, your pre-service teachers, some people already have their jobs. So whether you haven't been hired or you currently have a job, you need to ask yourself a question, why would you get hired? Well, you got hired because the administrator that you sat down with, whether it was an administrator or the principal, they wanted to see that you are going to make students interested in learning. You're going to facilitate the process and have kids expand their knowledge. And the second thing is to create a well-managed classroom. I remember in the interviews I went on initially, and I'm sure some of you can attest the same, that administrators always ask similar questions. And one of the questions that they always ask, I don't know, no matter what grade level you teach or where you're teaching, in some form, shape of another, that they ask you the question, if, if little Johnny, insert any name you want, does X, Y, and Z, how are you going to react and what are going to be the consequences for that child? All administrators want to know and get a feel for how you deal with problems in the classroom. You know, but in my mind, it's not so much of a how do you deal with it, it's more of how do you prevent it. And our discussion today is going to show you great ways on how to prevent that, those discipline issues in the classroom. So some other questions I want you to ask yourself. Should classrooms mirror a business-like atmosphere? You know, that's lots of research out there that suggests that your classroom is just like a business. And there's some people that think that's, that's preposterous, that's awful. You should never equate a classroom with a business environment. But I challenge you, think. For those of you who have part-time jobs, I know most teachers have uh, part-time jobs as well. Um, think about your job, whether it's in a business environment, restaurant environment, any, anywhere it is. You have to be somewhere at a certain time. There are certain objectives and expectations for your job. And if you don't live up to those expectations, there could possibly be consequences and reinforce and reinforces the good things that you do at your, at your job. So yeah, in, in essence, it does radiate a business-like environment. Uh, the next question is, how do I create a classroom environment where students understand expectations and are motivated to learn. All right. And the third question is, since classroom management is typically a hands-on learning experience, how can I best prepare myself? And my answers to those second and third questions, you know, I'm going to bring in a little uh, psychology into this, into this presentation. A huge basis for your ability to be an effective teacher, a teacher that kids want to come to every day, that they feel like you care about them, that you're there to help them no matter what, and that you're, head, you're there to prepare them for life in their other classes and outside of the school, has to do with psychology, how you motivate your students. How do you set up your classroom in a way that creates ownership for the kids in your classroom? When you give them rules at the beginning of the year, do you tell them what the rules are, or do you do an activity that gives them the power to create their own rules in the classroom. So those are some of the things I want you to think about when we talk about creating that classroom environment that eliminates those discipline problems. And we'll expand a little more as we, as we move on. So like I mentioned at the, be at the beginning, we're going to filter through this, this workshop under these four different categories. And through my teaching experiences, whether it's at the, in the classroom system for Orange County and Lake County schools, or at UCF, you know, classroom management can be divided into these four simple areas. Uh, organization, 
meaning your classroom structure, how are things organized, how are you organized as a teacher. Uh, the second part is communication. How do you talk to your students, but more importantly, how do you listen to your students? A lot of people like to talk, talk a talk, talk, but when it comes to the other side of the table, do you really listen to your students? And if you do really listen to your students, do you show them how you're listening? And we'll talk about that as well. Monitoring. Are you aware of what's going on in your room? Do you have the withedness? Do you have the eyes in the back of your head? Do you walk around the classroom? These are things that administrators look for when they come in your room. Are you the teacher that stands at the front of the classroom but does not circulate around the room? Regardless of whether you're doing direct instruction, you're lecturing, inquiry-based instruction, cooperative learning, no matter what kind of activity you're doing, are you circulating or you just stand in one place? And the last and most powerful, in my opinion, the most powerful part of an effective teacher and maintaining classroom management system that creates the optimal learning environment is how you teach. That, I think, is the number one priority for teachers. As you guys are graduating from your undergraduate programs in education, or as you're going into your next year of experience in the classroom, always keep in your mind that how you're teaching your students is so key, and we'll talk about that as well. All right, so let's talk about the first category. And like I said, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to uh, raise your hand. All right, so we're talking about organization. First day of school, you always learn in your ed classes that the first day is very, 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 very important. Same goes for any grade level. Your expectations and, and the student's understanding of the consequences are imperative that you go over this. For example, when I taught middle school and high school, first day of the class of the school year, no matter what the situation is, I hand the students their syllabus, okay, I had that in middle school and high school, obviously elementary school, something a little different, um, and you go over the expectations, how you grade, everything that has to do with your class, whether you're teaching English, math, social studies, science, phys ed, doesn't matter, expectations need to be set. Now, you always heard that phrase, you know, don't smile till Christmas. Well, I don't want to extend it that far, but it does hold some truth there. I'm not saying you come in your first day of school and you scream at the top of your lungs and you, you're staring at all the kids and you're making them fearful. That's not what I'm saying. But students will respect you and respect the class if they understand what their expectations are. Regardless of your inner thoughts on certain kids and you might have gotten some feedback about, every kid comes into the classroom understanding your expectations, but you have to radiate them to your students. As you continue through your first days, your first week, your first two weeks, you have to be conscious on how you interact with your classroom organization about playing favorites. When I say playing favorites, calling on certain kids because they always raise their hand, or maybe you know of someone or had them previously, and you always call on them or asking them to do things. These are things you have to keep in mind. And the last thing I have listed on this slide is to always maintain control while giving your students a sense of ownership. What I mean by that, and I have the little policeman cartoon in the bottom right, I'm not saying walking around with a billy club, but it's so key to give your students a sense of ownership in the class, meaning the classroom rules. There are so many uh, activities out there that you can do with your classroom uh, to give kids a sense of ownership when it comes to class rules. An activity that I did in middle school for, for many years is, you know, they'll come in the first, maybe the first day we're doing the syllabus and going over the class. The next day that they'll come in, I'll put them in little groups or three or four students and I'll give them an easy instruction. I'll put it up on the, bo on the board. You know, if you were in charge, give me 10 10 rules that you think are the most important for the classroom, okay? And then, obviously, you'll have some people putting down funny things, but for the most part, they know what your expectations are. So as you have all these groups doing these things, maybe you have it write it on a big post-it or a poster board, 
then you go around and let everybody share their responses. And then as a class, you know, you can write down the responses that you hear over and over again. No matter where you do this activity, whether it's elementary, middle, or high school, you will always, always, always get similar responses from all of the groups in your room and all of your classes, depending maybe you have a six or seven period day, block schedule, whatever it is. And that just shows you that students understand expectations. So you take all of their responses, you pick maybe three to five rules, always keep it simple, and you put it up on the wall so the kids get a sense of ownership that, hey, we made the rules. So something to, to think about. And there's lots of different activities along the same lines. Uh, the second of the four ideas that I want to express to you is communication. How you talk to your students and how you listen to your students. These are very, very, very big facets of being an effective educator in the classroom. Okay? And why? Well, for obvious reasons. You know, when you're talking to students, and, and these, you know, if anyone in the room is, is a parent or have or siblings or, or relatives, you know, when kids cause problems or they do something wrong, you know, you're always supposed to deal in the present, not thinking about what little Johnny or little Susie did yesterday or a month ago or last year. When you deal with students in the classroom, you have to deal with the situation at hand. You know, the last thing you want to do is bring up to a student, hey, you remember last week when you did this or last month when you did this, then in their mind, they're automatically thinking that, hey, this teacher thinks I'm guilty, they think I'm a horrible person, and then they just shut down. Um, you know, it's all about communication with them, talking to them, not about them. The way you interact with your students. You know, I always try my best to have conversation with students just the way I would have conversations with anyone in this workshop, with any colleagues, whether it's at the high school level or at the college level, with friends. It's all about communication. It's all about, you know, the golden rule, if you want to go back to that. It's all about how you communicate with people, respecting people, and then you receive respect in return. And in doing so, you're creating a positive role model for your students. Just think of it this way. If you have a student in your classroom that causes disturbance and you don't interact with them in the most appropriate way and maybe you call them out in front of the class, well, guess what? The other 24 students in that classroom are watching you at that moment and they know, hey, if I do something, this teacher is going to act the same way to me. Okay, so you're just putting out that, that negative role, mo role model aspect of, you know, this teacher is just going to call me out in the classroom and just be disrespectful to me. So I want you to think about those when you're talking about sending skills. Now, when you talk about receiving and listening, you know, we have a, I have a couple of key things up on the board here. You know, using empathetic, no evaluative listening kind of goes to the sending skills, dealing in the present. You know, when you're listening to students, you never want to evaluate what you're hearing. You want to think... Be empathetic. Feel for their situation. If a kid is picking on them or they don't feel good that day or they're having problems with the content, you know, you want to be empathetic to the situation. And when it comes to your student responses in the classroom, this is another way of looking at your receiving skills. When you're having a discussion in your classroom, a conversation class-wide or with a group of students, Kids want to know that you're listening to them, just nodding and shaking your head. You know, maybe you had a conversation. You know, I asked the question, have you ever had a conversation with a friend of yours or a colleague, and they're just talking, and you smile and nod your head like you're listening, but you're really not paying attention to everything they're saying. Your mind might be somewhere else. And I know many of you, you know, including myself, I've been in that situation, are, you know, smiling and saying, yeah, yeah, I've done that. So to take it an extra step to show your students that you care, paraphrase it. Now, I'm not saying repeating everything word for word back to your students, but a couple of words to show them that you understand what they're saying and, and, and you're on the same page with that. So, you know, something to think about. These are all ideas I want you to think about as you're going into your classroom. Um, making eye contact, looking at students. But on the same note, I want to throw a little multicultural education in this workshop. When you're making eye contact with students, 
don't always expect students to look you back in the eye. So I'm, I mentioned multicultural education because, you know, for example, if you have some, you know, first generation Japanese student, for example, in your class, moved over from Japan, they're in your classroom, and you're talking to them, you're listening to their conversation, they're asking you a question, and you look at them, you make eye contact, but the student's not looking at you, and you think that's rude. Because, you know, in America, American culture, it's respectful to look people in the eye when they talk to you. But when you think of other cultures, for example, Japanese culture, it's not respectful, it's disrespectful to look an adult in the eyes. So just a little a tidbit of an example to keep in mind with certain cultures in your classroom. And the last thing when you talk about receiving skills is, you know, being a leader with your body language. So what do we mean by when we say leadership with body language? I want to throw that question out there. Um, if anybody wants to speak or type it in the box, you know, feel free to raise your hand. So what do we mean when we say leadership with body language in the classroom? Anybody like to share? Eric's typing. No arms crossing. Very good. Okay. We've got to lead by example. Good posture. Eye contact. So, you know, posture is a big thing. We have not the nonverbal construct students interpret for better or for worse. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, for example, when, it's, when the teachers, if you're standing in the classroom having conversations with students and you don't think about this, but if, let's say, you're leaning on the doorway or you're leaning on a wall or you're sitting at your desk, you know, these are all types of body language that show things to students. Now, I'm not saying every single student in your class is like, this guy doesn't care or this woman doesn't care if they're sitting down. But a lot of them pick up on that, and it's all about being enthusiastic about what you're doing and displaying that to the students. So very good, very good examples. Thank you for sharing. All right, so the next, the third area that I wanted to facilitate this conversation is monitoring. You know, it's a fact. Misbehavior, misbehavior happens when students find something more interesting to do than listen to you or do your lesson. You know, you don't want to think of it that way. You never want to think that you're a boring teacher. Nobody wants to be a boring teacher. But sometimes you have to take a step back and look at what you're doing and how you're doing it. You know, if kids are not interested, you might come out of the College of Education, just like myself, when I, when I finished my uh, graduate degree in social science education and I got my first job as a teacher, um, I went into that classroom, had all these great activities that I thought were awesome, and I taught world history in high school in Orange County, and some of those things, guess what? They didn't think it was so interesting. They weren't enthusiastic as I was. So, you know, it's a reality. We go to school, and we get our degrees in education, and we do our, our content, whether it's history, math, uh, literature, anything. You're doing it because it's passionate for you. It's a passion that you have. But you have to understand that not all kids think that math is awesome. They don't wake up and say, I love math every day. So you have to keep that in mind. But can you get them motivated into math? Of course you can. Of course you can create an environment that gets them excited. But you have to think about that when you're, when you're running your classroom, that, hey, are these kids in tune to what I'm doing and do they think it's interesting? So keep that in mind. So the question is, am I so boring? So I listed on here three basic reasons why students misbehave. You know, one, they're not involved. Here's an example. If you're doing, let's just throw out a specific activity. If you're doing a cooperative learning activity, uh, maybe you're doing a jigsaw strategy with your students, OK? Does everyone have their role? Did you explain that each student has to do X, Y, and Z and give them the expectations and the procedures? If every kid's not involved in it and they don't understand, they're going to misbehave. Now, when we say misbehave, doesn't mean they're going to throw a desk across the room, but just not being engaged in, in the activity in the classroom. Do they not understand it? Are you giving them an activity or an assignment that they just don't get the content? 
Maybe you didn't go over it enough. Maybe they just were too shy to ask questions. They just don't understand what the topic is about. Whatever subject it is, they just don't get it. And the third one is they can't get assistance when needed. Is your classroom set it up in a way that kids feel comfortable to raise their hand? You know, I've, I've heard from students that I've built relationships with at the high school level, even some students at the university level that I've had a few times. You know, they tell me that I don't want to raise my hand because the teacher just won't call on anyone. They don't want to give answers to anybody. Or they make fun of people that get the answers wrong. You know, no one wants to think that there's a teacher in the school system that when a student raises their hand and they get it wrong, they're very condescending to them or sarcastic. You never want to think that, but the reality is sometimes classroom environments are like that. Okay, it's, it's not just to that extreme per se, but just the fact that the kids don't feel like they're, they're getting the assistance they're needed. Is there not enough time being spent explaining a certain content? The teacher's not being able to go around and work one-on-one -on -one with students. Or maybe he's not available after school for help. All of these things come into play when we talk about classroom management and discipline. All right, so how do you respond to these things? How do you deal with these situations in the classroom? If, if something happens and a student acts out or does something that's inappropriate or it's not according to the plan of the class for that day, you know, how do you respond? Well, here are some suggestions, okay? Obviously, you want to be positive with students and you, and you want to react calmly and quickly. Now, on a side note, when you have situations with students, you know, you're supposed to not make a scene in front of the class. It's always good to take a student and talk to them in the doorway, keeping the door open and having them maybe stand outside and, and talking to them. Remember, it's all about communication. You know, not talking down to the students, but talking to them on their, on their level and asking them, you know, what's the situation? You know, why did you do X, Y, and Z? Another thing in the flow of the classroom is to remind students of the rules and procedures. If you did that activity, like I mentioned before, about um, having the kids create their own rules in the classroom, and then when it's all said and done, you have them nicely written, maybe you laminated it, put it up on the wall, point to the sign and say, you know, we came up with these rules. How are you not following them? What are you doing that's counteracting these rules that we came up in the classroom? And nine times out of ten, you know, kids are aware of this and they might feel ashamed that they, maybe they did something wrong and then they'll act the right way. You know, in the lower grades, definitely 100%, those things will weed themselves out if you point to the wall. As you get to your juniors and seniors in high school, you know, they might giggle and laugh if you point to the wall and say, hey, you're not following our respect others uh, rule up on the board. So there's different ways you interact with students on, on um, different levels. So we have Tina, so asking what they did wrong is better than telling them. Yeah, of course, of course it is, because you're, you're turning that responsibility to them. You're making it a teachable moment, because you're asking them to reflect on what they did and how it's wrong. And let me tell you, there might be some instances where a student does something wrong and they honestly didn't realize it was wrong, because they were not taught that that was wrong. So you have to show them and make them think about the rule and say, oh, well, you know what? What I did was wrong. So it's all about learning experiences. Um, inform the students that they're choosing the consequence. It goes to cooperative discipline ideology. You know, if you're, if you're doing this, then you're breaking this rule. Or either you can follow the rules or these are the consequences. So, you know, it's, it's just giving options, laying the options out for the students so they understand that they're making their decision. And consequences should be determined based on their grade level. I know it's small on the screen there. Um, I'm not going to click on it because, you know, I want to keep the conversation going and, and leave some room at the end. But if you notice on the right-hand side of the screen, ladies and gentlemen, there's a box that says links. You know, I put some links for our websites and, and YouTube channel, but on the top, um, there's a link that I label consequences game. And if you click on it, Right now, you don't have to. Uh, you, you can click it and save it. This is a very good website, and basically, it's an interactive. I called it a game, but it's more of a learning experience where there's a page of different 
uh, positive consequences, negative consequences, and you have to m drop them in the category, whether they're positive, negative, or they just don't fit at all. And after each one of your choices, uh, there's a professor from university that comes on and explains why it's positive, why it's negative, so it gives you kind of a reasoning for each one of your choices. Very, very good website, highly engaging. I, I very, definitely tell you to check that out when we're over with this workshop. So the link is there. All you have to do is click on it and click Browse to, and you can save it on your computer. So it goes over a lot of different consequences. So I found that very, very useful website. Gives you good examples there. So the last, and like I mentioned before, what I, I believe, and I'm not saying that it's, it's better than the other three categories that we're talking about, but in my personal opinion, and you might disagree, I think the way you deliver your instruction, meaning your teaching strategies, uh, control every dynamic of your classroom. And, you know, leading educators emphasize that your quality of instruction, how you teach, your ability to find out how your students learn best, and then promoting that type of instruction in your classroom supersedes everything and ultimately drives your classroom management system and the ability that your kids understand expectations and they follow through. Everyone's engaged and there's slim to no behavior problems in the room. So let's talk a little bit about this, all right? So how do you make effective delivery? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull a little bit from Ed Psychology here, okay? Motivation is the key to success in the classroom, okay? And this plays along with a lot of our discussion tonight. If kids are not motivated to learn in your room, then you've lost them. Now the question is, the million dollar question is, how do you motivate someone? If you, we've all, you know, those in the classroom already have had experience teaching, or maybe you're in your internship now for our pre-service teachers, we always see that one student or group of students that doesn't want to interact with anyone. They might sit in the corner. They just don't raise their hand. They don't do anything. You know, that's not a slap in the face to you. It's you just have to find a way to motivate that student. We all know, we all have learned to, and to no end in our College of edu Education that kids learn differently. And it's our job as an educator to find the way that students learn best and then tailor our instruction towards that. Some of the ways to make it effective is evaluating students in, in their own work, letting them evaluate themselves, creating rubrics. There's research out there now with uh, students in elementary levels, kindergarten, first, second, third grade that are grading themselves. The teachers create rubrics. Some of the students make them themselves, and they grade their own work. You know, it's showing students what they've done well and what they've done not so well and how to improve it. How you ask your questions and giving time to respond. This is all a part of effective delivery. It's all psychology. If I ask a question to my room, you know, Different research shows different things, but typically for, for our sake of conversation, you know, anywhere from three to five seconds is the appropriate wait time. So I ask a question, and I wait one second and call on somebody. Right there, I've eliminated a majority of our classroom because they thought they're not smart enough because they weren't able to answer the question that quickly. So you start losing students, and the motivation levels go down. The self-efficacy of our students go down. So question techniques are so key in delivery, no matter what you're doing, whether it's cooperative learning, whether you're lecturing and talking about things, if you're having an open discussion about things, no matter what it is, you have to give students a response time. And the third, and I know we can go on and on with different ways to make effective delivery, but the third one I have up on the screen is appropriate difficulty. You have to start off small with easy tasks to gain confidence and motivate students and build up to appropriate levels of difficulty. Another example, I taught middle school. I got a job in Lake County my first year teaching middle school. I was put in what they called the academy. And basically what the academy meant is that it was all level one students in my classroom. Everyone scored a level one on the FCAT. So here I am, 
you know, a couple of years of teaching under my belt. I taught high school first, then I went to middle school, had all these great activities to engage students, cooperative learning activities, great discussion things, got in the classroom, did it, and most of, if not all, of the students failed and didn't do well. And, you know, I think to myself, what am I doing wrong? Because you can't ultimately go to the top level of the tier to challenge students. You have to build up that confidence in the students. It's all about providing work of appropriate difficulty. And as time went on and I gave kids that motivation and showed them success, then they were able to do some of the upper level activities that I had planned. So, so key to effective delivery. And then I label this one, keep delivery alive. Change it. I have a little learning pyramid down there on the bottom right. Um, it basically pulling off of the idea that everyone learns differently. You know, and, and key to not only that everyone learns differently, but how you engage with your students and how your students engage with each other. Meaning, do you have activities where kids teach kids? Do they review each other's work? Do they practice things? Do they discuss things? These are so key. You know, research has shown over and over again that peers learn best from each other. Students learn best from their peers. That interaction is so key. Give you an example. If a student doesn't at, understand something in class, and there's another student in the class that understands it 100%, if that student explains that concept to their friend, their peer in the class, they will understand it a lot better from them than coming from you. You know, that's shown that over and over again in research. And I've, I've witnessed it myself in my own classrooms. I'm not saying that your student's smarter than you, but it's just the fact that they're learning from their peers, that they're valuing their responses from their friends more powerful than coming from you. So something to think about. I'm just trying to get the wheels turning in your head. All right. Oh, a little blurry here. Hold on a second here. All right, so I want you to understand that, and I mentioned this before, and I'm, I apologize that this is looking a little blurry on your screen. Um, students always come into your room, and they understand what's expected from you and from them. So when they come to your classroom, whether it's elementary, middle, or high school, or college, they know that they're in there to learn. But if you don't frame everything, all these things we've been discussing here so far, how you set up your classroom, how you monitor, how you communicate, how you teach. If you don't do these effectively, they're not, they're not going to live up to those preconceived notions. It's not like kids come to you in elementary class. If you're teaching third grade or ninth grade or sixth grade, they're not coming into class saying, oh, man, what are we doing here? I don't get it. They know that they're there to learn. So it's your job to facilitate and guide that instruction in a way that promotes the interactive, effective learning environment that we talk about all the time in our classes. Um, a term I want to throw out there that hopefully you learned in some of your coursework at your uh, university is the term withedness. Now, I want you to think about this. This is 1970. This, this gentleman, Jacob Kooning, came up with the idea of withedness. Basically, it's the eyes in the back of your head. We're talking about 1970. We're in 2013. These are not new concepts, ladies and gentlemen. These have been around. It's whether we take it on our shoulders to create the environment that represent this is another story. You know, I was just in my class last night at, at UCF. I'm doing a grad ed psychology class. And we're, we're coming to the end of the six-week semester. And I'm trying to tie everything together. And we're talking about standardized testing last night. And just bringing everything together and understanding that all of these ideas tie together. And yes, it's great to know that the way you talk to students creates an environment. Yes, it's great to know that you have to make the material relevant to life outside of school. We all know this and we learn this in our classroom, but do you do it in your own classroom? That's the key. So this gentleman, Jacob Kuhn, and coming up with these ideas you know, 40 plus years ago, we know it. We get it, but not every teacher does it. That's the key. You have, to, you have to take these ideas and implement them in your classroom. All right, so some characteristics of a well-managed classroom. All right, students are deeply involved in their work. Do they understand it? Are you just teaching content or are you teaching concepts? 
You know, that's a whole nother workshop in itself. There's a big difference between content and concepts. Content is having your kids trying to memorize as much facts and ideas as they possibly can and regurgitating them on a test. But teaching concepts are the ideas behind that content that they could translate and transfer to other classes and life outside of school. So you have to make them involved in their work. And this goes for any grade level. Um, students know what's expected of them and are successful. Did you create that at the beginning of the school year? Did you show them through a syllabus or a chart on the board or, what, or through your voice, the, the expectations for them? Do you l little wasted time in your classroom? Bell the bell. We have one administrator in the room. Bell the bell is something that administrators look for when they come in your room for observations. When that bell rings, are the students engaged in a bell work activity or some kind of engaging activity, whether it's on their own, writing in a journal, or working with others? When there's five minutes left in the room, are your kids packing up? Are they hanging out by the door, lined up, ready to run out the room when that bell rings in middle school and high school? Are you engaging them and having them reflect on the day at the, end, at the end of the class period? Do you give them five minutes to take out a journal or write down what they learned today? Or a cool little quick activity that you can do with your classes that I do sometimes is going around the room when there's five minutes to go and everybody has to share one thing that they learned that day or one thing that was discussed in class and you can't repeat someone else. So if the kids know that this is coming, they pay a little more attention and have some more ownership over the material. So you go around the room and everyone shares a quick little snippet of something that you talked about that day. And is the climate of the classroom work oriented but relaxed and pleasant? You don't want a stressful environment. You want kids to enjoy being in your room. You don't want to be that teacher that is just, I'm going to lecture every day and give you a quiz and a test every week because you're creating an environment that's stressful for kids. Kids don't want to feel like they have to write down every single word and memorize it to be successful in your room. You have to create an environment that kids are learning for the future. And so, so some of the characteristics of a well-managed classroom. So, you know, to sum it up here, to wrap it together, um, you know, management describes how the classroom is organized and structured to prevent problems like we've been discussing. And obviously at the other side of the token, is that you know a discipline problem is one that compromises the instruction. So you never want to have a situation or a class environment where there's constant uh, discipline problems. Because if you're in a classroom, or maybe for the pre-service teachers, if you go into your observation, um, whether you're doing your junior observation or your senior observation, and you're working with kids, you, if you're in a classroom environment where there's always discipline problems, or maybe that one or two kids are always doing something wrong to divert the attention of others. You have to take a step back and look at your expectations and how you radiate them in your classroom. How are you teaching? Are you, are you making sure that every kid is on the same page, whether it's the expectations of how the classroom is ran or your content? You know, that's, there are lots of different strategies that you can do to make sure that everyone is on the same playing field. There's a lot of um, formative assessment strategies that you can do. Um, you can in implement technology in the classroom. Uh, if, you're, you, if you use Apple products or Android products, you know, when we're done with this presentation, if you haven't uh, have any experience with this before, do a quick search in the Apple Store on your computer or on your iPhone for um, rubrics. You know, you might thinking, rubric, what does that have to do with anything here? Well, there are simple rubrics. Some are free, some are a dollar, two dollars, that you can set up in a matter of minutes for your kids. And you could walk around when they're doing activities or you're having discussions, just little tally marks or rating one to five, and you can make your own categories on, you know, people's attentiveness, are they engaged, are they raising their hand? And these don't necessarily have to equate to a grade. But if you show your students this, these are the expectations that you might be doing this every day, every other day, so they think it's cool because you're using technology in the classroom at one, but then they stay on, on task and they interact and engage with the classroom. So that's just a little, little idea there to put in your mind when it comes to 
classroom management and how you how you shape your room. So that's basically you know the conversation. I know that there are a couple of examples and things in the, that I did so far tonight that I mentioned. This could be another workshop in its own, so I didn't want to go too far off tangent. But we do have a couple of minutes left um, for questions. And I